Hey, well, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, currently, we are in the Case for Christmas, Evidence for the Identity of Jesus by uh, Lee Strobel and Bill Butterworth. And this is a fourth session. We're in our third session. I almost said 12, but we're in our third. Uh, and the first one was Setting the Record Straight, second, Beneath the Fake News, uh, and three is a mind-boggling proposition. So <clears throat> I want to jump straight into to this today. So I want to go ahead and pray for you, and then we'll get started. Let us pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you because you've given us an opportunity to come into your presence, Father, to study, uh, to know your word, Father. Thank you for providing lessons. Thank you for providing um, uh, your Holy Spirit that would bring us closer to you. We do this in the name of all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, session three is a mind-boggling proposition. So I want to start off with, uh, if you've ever heard the Apostles' Creed, uh, it goes like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. I should have just said it instead of reading it. It would have been so much easier for me. Well, <clears throat> that's the Apostles' Creed. And that comes to us in a mind boggling proposition by, by Lee Strobel. Well, there are some Christian movies that can, uh, Christmas movies that can inspire you. There are some Christmas movies that can make you think. And there are some Christmas movies that are just plain silly. One, one classic released in 1989 certainly falls into this category. And some of y'all might know this as the Christmas Vacation, one of my favorites. It's a screwball comedy with, with John Hughes. Uh, 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 it's a screwball comedy written by John Hughes about a dad named Clark Griswold, played by actor Chevy Chase. Now, who leads his wife, Ellen, and two children, Audrey and Rusty, through the litany of Christmas traditions, each of them ending in destruction. So that's a really, really formal way of describing it. I would just say it's a, it's a goofy movie. Well, the film covers all the Christmas movie bases. There's a uh, shopping for gifts scene. There is extended family showing up unexpectedly scene, uh, bringing along their correspond corresponding cornucopia of dysfunction. So there's a Christmas Eve dinner disaster scene and there's the running gag in the movie that clark has uh a t he has an attaching twenty five thousand lights to the exterior of his house and once uh one scene clark has taken his family to the forest to find the perfect christmas tree so <clears throat> if and, and in that scene it says this is clark speaking it says you see kids this is what our forefathers did and audrey says i can't feel my legs clark they walked into the woods, they picked out that special tree, and they cut it down with their bare hands. Audrey, Mom, I can't feel my hips. Ellen, Mom, says, Clark, Audrey's frozen. And then Clark says, it's all part of the experience, honey. Well, Clark wants this Christmas to be the best ever, but everything ends in disaster. The 20-pound turkey is left in the oven too long. The uncle sets the perfect Christmas tree on fire. Clark cuts down another one from his yard, but it contained a squirrel uh, inside the tree. The 25,000 lights won't shine at first when he flips the switch. The big Christmas bonus he was expecting doesn't materialize. In its place is a membership of the Jelly of the Month Club. See, before the movie concludes, there are appearances by cops, a SWAT team, and Santa and an exploding reindeer. But, as in the most uh, comedy farces, it all works out for the Griswolds. Well, of course, the movie pushes the bounds of reality. It would be impossible for the exterior of the turkey to look so pristine if the interior was all dried out. See, the tree, the tree that Clark picks out, a Douglas fir, isn't native to Illinois where the Griswolds supposedly live. See, the number of Christmas lights Clark puts on his house would require an estimated 157.5 kilowatts to run, which would short out the home's main breaker. And Clark uh, been able to get around that problem. The heat from those lights would have li likely set the, hood, the whole house on fire. When some people look at the events of Jesus' birth, they often come to the same conclusion. As we saw last week, many critics claim that all the stories about Jesus' entrance into the world are based on old legends, myths, and fairy tales. For them, the visit of the Magi, the angels, and the star over Bethlehem pushed the bounds of reality. And the concept of God becoming flesh and being born of a virgin is simply too mind-boggling to be believed. Well, today we will continue to investigate the Christmas story and unwrap this di dilemma known as the virgin birth of Christ. We will look where the evidence points and see if we can truly have confidence that what the Bible says about these events is true. So, 
<laughs> it was hard for me to read that because I'm imagining the movie and I want to laugh. I want to start cracking up laughing. But it's so true. There's a lot of people who disbelieve because they think it's so hard for this the nativity story to even take place. But it's, it's all true. And we're going to learn about that today. But before we watch the video, I want to ask you a question. Are you decorating your house or your home for Christmas? If so, how elaborate are your decorations? Well, um, I'm looking around right now and uh, they're, per they're kind of elaborate. I think we could have done more and I think we are continuing to do more. I think we decorate up until the 25th and then from there, we then we leave it till May 7th. So it, it takes a while to take everything down. But uh, decorating is one of the fun things that we do at my house. What about this? What is your favorite part about Christmas dinner? Why? Uh, tamales. Hello. Uh, I think, uh, well, for me, that's, it's tamales. But what's your favorite part? Put, put your, your favorite part about the Christmas dinner inside. Maybe you have turkey. Maybe you have ham. I don't know. Someone once told me they just cooked two chickens. And I said, well, what's the difference? And they said, oh, well, Christmas, we took, cooked two chickens. And then every other day, we just cook one. Well, where's the most unusual place you ever spent Christmas? And how... Did it happen that you were there? Well, I'm going to say my uncle's house. I'm not going to tell you anymore. I don't want to say it online because I don't want repercussions for it. But my family will probably know and they'll probably laugh about that. So the question was, where was the most unusual place you ever spent Christmas? And how did it happen that you were there? It has to be my uncle's house. So my family gets the joke. You may not. Come talk to me, I'll tell you. But I don't want to say it online. Anyways. Well, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Lee Strobel here. And uh, take it away, Lee. Someone once asked famous talk show host Larry King who he would choose to interview if he could interview anyone in history. And his response was quick. He said, Jesus Christ. His questioner asked, well, what would you ask him? And King replied, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born. The answer to that question would define history for me. Well, King is right. If Jesus of Nazareth were born of a virgin, then that would really change everything, wouldn't it? Because it would be strong confirmation of his identity as a unique son of God. But of course, Jesus isn't physically here to ask him about it. And besides, how could anyone prove that their conception was virginal? Unlike the resurrection, where we have eyewitnesses and an empty tomb, we can't marshal that same kind of facts to prove that a virgin birth took place. But here's what we can do. We can see if the virgin birth makes sense, both theologically and scientifically. We can explore this question. Is it consistent with reality? Because at the center of Christmas is the fact that this was not just an ordinary birth. This was a supernatural occurrence, unlike any other birth in history. And it's embedded in our historic statements of faith. The Apostles' Creed says Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. While the Nicene Creed says, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. A lot of people around the world subscribe to those convictions. In fact, it's interesting to note that an impressive 79% of Americans believe that the virgin birth took place. And as we'll see in this session, their conclusion is fully justified by the facts. Dr. Seuss said in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? And it certainly does mean more than what we see happening in our very consumer-oriented approach to the holiday. Christmas, the incarnation, has kept theologians busy for centuries as they have pondered the depths of its mysteries. God becoming man, spirit taking on flesh, the infinite becoming finite, the eternal becoming 
time bound. It is a mind boggling proposition. And the virgin birth is at the center of it all, which rankles a lot of skeptics. In fact, perhaps the best known atheist of our time, Richard Dawkins of Oxford, referred to the virgin birth as religious propaganda and said with no small measure of condescension that it's very effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. The anti-theist comedian Bill Maher, who's a consistent critic of Christianity, offered this quip. He said, of course I believed in a virgin birth, but then something happened that made me doubt all of it. I graduated from sixth grade. And yet, the virgin conception of Jesus is clearly taught in Scripture. Matthew 1, verse 18 says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Luke describes what happens in the first chapter of his gospel, starting at verse 26, where he says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So we have two accounts of the origin of the virgin birth, each one in essential agreement while also offering different details. But why was the virgin birth necessary? And can we believe it even in the 21st century, an era of science, rationalism, and skepticism? Well, I'll mention two reasons why the virgin birth is important theologically. First, it makes it possible for Jesus to be both fully God and fully man, which is a foundational biblical claim about him. As one theologian put it, the virgin birth means that there was a combination of both human and divine influence in the birth of Jesus. His full humanity is evident from the fact of his birth from a human mother, and his full deity is evident from the fact of his conception in Mary's womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is fully God and fully man. Second, the virgin birth makes it possible for Christ to be born without original sin. All other people have inherited a corrupt moral nature thanks to our first father, Adam. But because Jesus didn't have a human father, his line of descent from Adam was partially interrupted. Also, this conception by the Holy Spirit prevented the transmission of sin from Mary as well. How do we know? Well, listen closely to Luke 1, verse 35. The angel replied to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, in other words, as a direct consequence of this action of the Holy Spirit, quote, the baby to be born will be holy, that is, morally pure or without sin, and he will be called the Son of God. 
As theologian Wayne Grudem points out, Luke specifically connects the conception by the Holy Spirit with the holiness or moral purity of Jesus. Now, many believe that the reason Mary didn't impart original sin to Jesus was because she herself was conceived in her mother's womb in a way so that she was without original sin. This is what is meant by the term immaculate conception. Contrary to what many people think, immaculate conception doesn't refer to the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb, but it refers to the conception of Mary in her mother's womb. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. First, why didn't Mary inherit original sin from her mother? Was she sinless too? You have to keep going back through the generations to fix the sin problem. And second, this doctrine of the Immaculate Conception isn't taught anywhere in Scripture. Instead, it was established as dogma in a teaching by Pope Pius IX on December the 8th, 1854. I look at this whole matter in a different way. Personally, I believe it's enough to know that in some manner, the unbroken line of descent from Adam was interrupted by the Holy Spirit's divine conception of Christ. And as a consequence, he was born without the stain of original sin. So, there are good theological reasons for the virgin birth. Now, some critics maintain that the virgin birth is a mere story that was invented by Christians many years after Jesus' death as a way to elevate his status. But the evidence contradicts that. Actually, the reports of the virgin birth are quite early. In fact, within the first generation of Christians. Matthew and Luke both talk about the virgin birth in their Gospels. And as we saw in our last session, these Gospels themselves come quite quickly after Jesus' death. Luke within 30 years or so, and Matthew also within that first generation. And remember how we noticed similarities and some differences in the account of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke? This indicates that the two of them were drawing on even earlier and independent sources. When we study how many times Mary and Joseph are mentioned in each gospel, we find that Luke's account is essentially based on Mary's perspective. In fact, he may very well have interviewed Mary or her friends before he wrote his gospel. The New Testament scholar Richard Baucom argues that the material that's unique to Luke may have come from Joanna or Susanna, both of whom Luke mentions in Luke 8 verse 3 and 24 verse 10, and who undoubtedly knew Mary. As for Matthew, his account is based on Joseph's perspective. Even though Joseph apparently died before Jesus' public ministry began, he probably passed along his story to his children. And we know that Matthew and James, who was a half-brother of Jesus, were both early leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So, Matthew might very well have heard Joseph's perspective of the birth of Jesus from James. In any event, the story of the virgin birth predates both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And that means it wasn't some later legend. Actually, according to Matthew, the virgin birth was even foretold by Isaiah some 700 years before it took place. And we'll talk about that in our next session. But is the virgin birth scientifically plausible? I mentioned in The Case for Christmas the story of Dr. William Lane Craig, a philosopher who originally thought the idea of the virgin birth was absurd. Why? Because women lack the genetic material necessary to create a male child. So for Mary to give birth to a son, it would have necessitated the creation of a Y chromosome out of nothing in Mary's ovum. Dr. Craig went on to earn two doctorates and become a leading proponent of what is called the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. This argument consists of three points. First, it says that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now, 
Ask yourself, can you think of anything that began to exist that doesn't have a cause behind it? No. Even the famous skeptic David Hume said, I have never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. So whatever begins to exist has a cause. Second, scientists now agree that our universe began to exist at some point in the past. Alexander Vilenkin, who's the director of the Institute of Cosmology at Tufts University, said, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape, he said. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. So, if whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist at some point in the past, therefore, point three, there must be a cause behind the universe. Now, Think about it for a moment. What kind of a cause would be capable of bringing a universe into existence? Well, he must be powerful, given the incredible immensity of the creation event. He must be smart, given the mind-blowing precision of that event. He must be immaterial or spirit, because he existed before anything physical existed. He must be timeless or eternal, because physical time didn't even come to an existence until the creation. He must be personal, because he had to make the decision to create. He must be caring, because he so carefully crafted a habitat where we can flourish. And the scientific principle of Occam's razor tells us there would be just one creator. So, powerful, smart, spirit, eternal, personal, <laughs> Caring, unique, I mean, that's a pretty good description of the God of the Bible. So Dr. Craig's conclusion, and mine as well, is that Genesis 1-1 should be regarded as scientifically accurate when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all of this helped Dr. Craig accept the virgin birth of Jesus. How? Well, he explained it this way. If I really do believe in a God who created the universe, then for him to create a Y chromosome would be child's play. New Testament scholars Andreas Kostenberger and Alexander Stewart agree, and I believe their perspective is worth quoting. They said, quote, the only reason to doubt the possibility of the miracle itself would be a prior commitment to philosophical naturalism. That is, the belief that the material world is all that exists and that there is no such thing as God or supernatural intervention. From this perspective, miracles just don't happen. This worldview assumes that science can explain everything, but such an approach demands more from science than science can produce. If one, however, acknowledges the existence of a God powerful enough to create all that exists, there remains no reason to doubt that such a God could intervene in history in this supernatural kind of way. This is indeed the God who is presupposed on every page of the Bible and who has been worshiped and served by human beings from the creation of the world. Could a God who spoke the universe with its countless galaxies into existence be unable to cause a virgin to conceive? Popular Christian author and pastor Tim Keller put it this way, If a God exists who is big enough to create the universe in all its complexity and vastness, why should a mere miracle be such a mental stretch? Even a miracle like Christmas. This dual nature of Jesus, his humanity and his divinity, is important to you and me. Thanks to the humanity, the fact that he entered into our world on Christmas morning, he can relate to our situation. 
as Eugene Peterson renders John 1, 14, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus personally experienced what it's like to live on our planet. And so when we bring him our problems, our worries, our challenges, he can relate. Hebrews 4.15 says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And because of his divinity, he can give us supernatural wisdom. He can offer the power of God to help us. He can perform powerful miracles and wonders, and he can open up the gates of heaven for all who follow him. As theologians often explain, he is truly transcendent. That is, God is above everything, while at the same time, he is eminent. That is, near to us. He's close enough to reach out to. He's close enough to talk to. He's close enough to lean on. So let me ask you a question. Which of these attributes, the humanity or the divinity of Jesus, do you most need to tap into this holiday season? Well, welcome back. Always uh, so much information from Lee Strobel. Go back, break it down throughout the week. Uh, listen to it, research it, uh, use vetted resources. Well, you know, God becoming man, spirit taking on flesh, the infinite becoming of, of, of finite, the eternal becoming of time bound. It's a mind boggling proposition. And the virgin birth is all at the center of it. Now, the virgin conception of Jesus is clearly taught in Scripture. Now, I'm going to read to you Matthew 1.18, and this is what it says. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, even in Luke 1.34-35, it says, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Well, why, you have to ask yourself, why is the birth, uh, the virgin birth, important theologically? And we, we have two reasons for this. So the first reason for the virgin birth being the most important is, first, it makes it possible for Jesus to be fully God and fully man, which is the foundational biblical claim about him. It, it, that's, that's the basis of, of, our, of our foundation of faith, and it, it had to be that way. Second, it makes it possible for Christ to be without original sin. All other people have inherited a corrupt moral nature thanks to our first father, Adam. Now, some of you are like, original sin? Let me just give a quick definition. Original sin. Everyone is born sinful, right? And it's the state of sin that, according to Christian theology, and char characterizes all human beings uh, uh, beings as a result of Adam's fall. So Adam sinned, so therefore everything else. After that, the sin came into the world. So, so sin kind of just jumped onto us, right? But it also means, like in a nutshell, that we are all born with an urge to sin. Don't believe me? Just think about your day today. You probably sin. Uh, I think it's like 7.25 or sometimes at least. Uh, I think I read that somewhere. Well. Some critics maintain the virgin birth is a story invented by Christians many years after Jesus' death as a way to elevate his status. But reports of the virgin birth are quite early, in fact, within the first generation of Christians. So think about it, within the first generation. Um, the easiest way to describe that is like, okay, say someone comes over and they're an immigrant. The first generation would be their children. So think about the stories that you've told your children. Uh, they probably known by heart and can speak them exactly the same way to you. And that's the thing. These stories were recorded just like that, told by the eyes who had seen them. Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and that's Genesis 1.1. So if we believe that God who created the universe, then for him to create a Y chromosome would be child's play. Think about it. I don't know, just think about it. Like, God created the universe. How much easier would it be for him just to create one little Y chromosome? It's child's play. Like, he spoke the world into existence. I can't speak anything to make it happen. I, you know, it's just, that's how powerful God is. Well, the dual nature of Jesus, his humanity, and his divinity is important. 
Well, because of his humanity, he can relate to our situation. So Jesus became lower than angels. We've talked about that, especially during our Bible study of angels, so that he might become uh, one of us, right? And But because of his divinity, he can give us supernatural wisdom, offer the power of God to help us perform powerful miracles and wonders, and are open up the gates of heaven. Those are all the things that Jesus can do for us, being that he came, was fully man, but still fully God. Now, I'm going to read a few questions to you, and this is to get you thinking, this is to get you dialoguing, and this Bible study is doing exactly what I wanted it to do. It has you thinking, even to the point where you're like, man, some of it's all too much for me. That's what it is. You, you, you should feel overwhelmed by the power and the intelligence and the nature and the awesomeness of God our Father in heaven, right? To where it should be leave you like, and that's the thing. Uh, some, some people get discouraged because you're like, man, I don't, you know, like, I can't follow. Well, guess what? The more you study the Bible, the more you realize that you don't know. And that's a good thing because you want to learn more about Jesus. If you knew everything about Jesus and God, our Father, the Holy Spirit, then what kind of God would he be? So actually, the more you jump into it, the more questions you're going to have, the more things you're going to go, oh, wow. So that, what, am I even more confused than what I started out with? So what happens when that happens? You either run from it or you get into it and then you become strong in your faith. You become ready in season and out of season. So Bible studies shouldn't be meant just to make you feel good. They should challenge you. They should make you feel uncomfortable. They should make you feel like, man, I really don't know that much. Thank God I got a father who will guide me, right? So that's think about that when we're going through these questions and you're watching these videos. Well, what are some reasons why the virgin birth is so important in Christian theology? Well, think about it. It shows that Jesus was born without original sin, the basis of our theology and, and beliefs. So that's just a few. That's just one. So if you know what, okay, what are some reasons why the virgin birth is so important to Christian theology? I gave you one. It shows that Jesus was born without original sin. If you have more, write them in or type them in or thumb them in into the comments, okay? I need you to participate. I'll give you a second. Okay, next question. Why is it important that Jesus was fully divine and why is it important that Jesus was fully human? Now, I just read this to you because the reason that he was fully divine is because he gives us supernatural wisdom and offer the power of God to help us perform miracles and wonders and opens up the gates of heaven for us. That's, that's, that's the reason why it was important for him to be divine. But what about human? Because he's, in his humanity, he can relate to our situation. We have a king that understands the things that we're going through. He was tempted like us. You know, he hurts like us. He, 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 uh, he, he got angry like us, right? Yeah, remember when they sinned against his father in the temple and he threw some tables over? And he got sad, right, when, uh, when uh, Lazarus died. And then he got sad when he came in the, the, the great processional, coming back into Jerusalem, being able to, to see what was going to be happening, and that made him sad. See, he felt like us, so that means he can understand us. We have a God that understands us. How, how, how awesome is that? Now, my next question is, why would critics say the disciples made up the story of the virgin birth? Is there any advantage to the first century believers in propagating a lie? For them, would creating a fiction instead of relating the truth really elevate Jesus, who Jesus was? And I put yes because it would be a strong confirmation of his identity as the unique son of God. You know, <clears throat> people are going to say what they want to say. Now, I love this because it's considered an, an apologetic way of looking at the virgin birth. It's an apologetic way of looking at the Jesus Christ in coming to our earth. And, and you know, and in faith, it, our faith in Jesus isn't based on this Bible study. And I have to tell you this way, that, that we don't need this proof. But what this is doing is it's setting us up to sort of be able to use the Word of God uh, in a way that would be uh, sufficient that a atheist would understand, a scientist would understand. And that's what Lee Strobel's doing right here. He's giving us the, the sort of tools and, you know, I don't want to say the weapons, but he's giving us the tools, the, the right words to say when these people come and try to deny, like when they say, oh, well, it was done this way. Well, not really. What you're saying there is you're saying that they made up this, these stories, but honestly, based on your rules of identifying truth in the secular world, these stories were written well, way well before any of those other stories were written. So if anybody was being copied, it was the Christians being copied in order to make their own belief system valid. That makes sense? Hope it does. Well, I'm going to read John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, let me read that again. 
pay close attention. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, what does that verse say to you? Can you think of other verses from John's Gospel that refer to Jesus as God in one way or another? What other questions do you have about Jesus' divinity, and what would you discuss with the group? Now, this is one of those questions that you got to answer for yourself. If you want to type this in too, type it in. That would be awesome to create great dialogue. One thing that I would hope for this church is that you go away from a Bible study, you come back to me and say, you know what, Pastor, I had this question about this. The, the great mark of, a, of, a, of good discipleship is that questions are being asked and questions are coming up. Questions are not a bad thing. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm the first one to tell you, I don't know everything, okay? But I know where to get that information in the Bible. I know, I, one professor told me, you don't know, have to know, you don't, you don't have to know everything. You just got to know where to go to get it. And what he's saying is, we have the Bible. Now, my prayer for the church is that at, at this time, that, that these questions would spark interest, that they would, that they would, you'd go beyond the study and, and that you would want to know more about Jesus Christ. And um, for us tonight, that, that's about everything. But I want to say a closing prayer for you. And I want you to, if, if you can, pair up with someone. Um, <clears throat> talk to them about the Bible study. And then, you know what? Say, hey, we need, we need more studies like this. Or, we, you know, uh, I'm interested in this, Pastor. Do you have any studies that are based on this? I'd love to know more. Man, I would love to share more stuff with you. Uh, but all right, and what are some ways that you can help? We're going to be looking for some leaders uh, to teach some Bible studies pretty soon. And, uh, but I want you to keep in mind, this is the season of gift giving. And the best gift you can do is, is, is share the everlasting blood of Jesus Christ with someone. You know, I think, I think about Jesus Christ coming to earth and I say, you know, he came in the form of a baby and he bought. And, and the thing is, he had to do that because he had to come in the form that would be able to bring blood. And, you know, we have that living blood, that living water, that living bread in us. And, and we have to be able to share that this Christmas. You know, um, come and, and, and join us on Sunday mornings. We have uh, Unwrapping Christmas, uncovering the, the, uh, the true meaning of what Christmas is. And understand that Jesus Christ came because he simply loves you. And because he loves you, the cross was always in his plan. And because the cross was in his plan, you were in his plan. No matter who you are, no matter what you're at, no matter what you've done. Now, I want to pray for you. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us a way, uh, uh, a way, a bridge back to your Father. How mighty you are that you would send your Son, Jesus Christ, to come in the form of a baby to save us from our sins, Father. Fully knowing that, that he, he came to live on earth so that He could die on earth. But evermore, you resurrected Him, Father, that, that, that we would see uh, your glory used by Him. Father, we come to you humbly and saying, be with those who are hurting right now. Be with those who are without. Uh, allow us to be that vessels of blessings, Father. That Allow us to participate in the miracles that, that others see as coincidence, Father. But we know it's not. We know that it's your hand at work. Father, we pray for those who are sick, those who are hurting. I pray for those in the church that uh, have unspoken prayer requests, Father. How they want to share but are still nervous to. I pray for those who are at the top of the mountain, Father. And I pray for those at the bottom. Father, may we all come together and just say that it's the day that you have made, and because of that, we will praise you for it. We give this your most holy name, I pray. Amen. Hey, well, quick, don't, don't forget, we don't have this on the slides, but this Saturday at the church, 2 p.m., uh, we're going to be showing uh, uh, Christmas Experience, I believe it's called. Hopefully I said that right. I didn't write it down. I should have. 2 p.m., you're definitely invited. Uh, you can bring social distancing. Uh, we'll be doing social distancing. And don't worry, don't forget, uh, Friday is 5.30. Meet at the church if you want to do the um, Christmas caroling. And then Sunday, 9 a.m., we're going to be having our Sunday uh, school Christmas party. So if you have any questions, just please give us a call at the office. But I want to say for now, goodbye. I'll see you on a Sunday. Bye-bye.